Good afternoon, I'm Jonathan Capehart, opinion writer for the Washington Post. Welcome to Washington Post Live. Stevie Van Zandt has been a part of the entertainment industry since the mid 1960s, from touring the world with Bruce Springsteen and the E Street Band, to being Tony Soprano's right-hand man, and his work as an activist, uh, Stevie Van Zandt's life's journey has taken him to places many of us can only dream of. In Unrequited Infatuations, a memoir which hit bookstores today, he shares his life story with us through wonderful and unvarnished storytelling, like you're sitting with him in a booth at Huston's Diner. And we get to hear some of those stories and learn more about his fascinating life right now. You see him right there, Stevie Van Zandt. Welcome to Washington Post Live. Hey, nice to be with you, Jonathan. I'm a big fan of yours. And, and it's very nice to meet you. And, you know, I, I think you tweeted at me, tweeted at me once. And I was like, wait, Stevie Van Zandt <laughs> follows me on Twitter. So this is a thrill to um, meet you, at least virtually. So let's talk about your book, which is out today. Why did you decide that now was the time to release a memoir? Well, I think it was partly opportunity. I mean, the uh, the quarantine, you know, suggested that uh, we were going to be home for a while. So uh, um, I have new managers. I never had managers my whole life. And I just acquired some managers and they were like, why don't you write a book, you know? So uh, I thought, you know, maybe it's the right time, you know, while I still remember like, you know, 20% of my life, maybe. I, I, I better I better write it down now <laughs> before it's all gone. <laughs> and um, and, I, and I, also, I also happen to have the most, the three most productive years of my life, uh, right before the quarantine, um, 2017, 18, 19, I put out two new albums, Soul Fire and Summer of Sorcery, and did two, two world tours with the Disciples of Soul, and uh, ended up releasing like six album packages. So it was an amazing amazingly productive time and um, and I, and kind of I reconnected with my life's work with my music work which I hadn't I hadn't really uh, done that in 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 over 20 years because uh, you know I started acting and then Bruce put the, put the band back together and um, you know and before you know it you know 20 years went by and I and I kind of abandoned my own work so I was re reconnecting to my to my music I, uh, I think really helped me uh, have some closure for that for that part of my life Mm -hmm. So what was the most important thing you wanted to share uh, about your life? Well, it's not so much my life uh, as much as the things I've observed and the things I've seen and uh, and the history that I that I that I lived with. I mean, I, I only missed the first decade of rock and roll. You know, I, I only missed the 50s. So uh, I was a kid in, in the mm -hmm. 60s watching it all happen. And um and it was such an extraordinary time, you know. I, I, I refer to it as a Renaissance period, and, and I and I mean that. Um, I don't believe that's hyperbole. I mean, I I I'm I'm I feel that the when when the most amazing and and greatest art being made is also the most commercial. Mm -hmm. You know, you have yourself a Renaissance. And mm -hmm. uh, growing up at that time, I wanted to you know I wanted to share um, share that sh share that '60s experience with people who missed it. And right into the '70s, which was just a glorious time to be alive, and and we were we were really the luckiest generation, and I, and I'm the luckiest of the luckiest generation. Um, it just felt like you know, it, it, it felt like something something that, that could be shared, you know, that, mm -hmm. that people might made a. Well, I want to jump. I want to jump into um, the the '60s and, and rock and roll because in in the book. Um, um, you wrote about the process of trading in your devotion to the Baptist, the Baptist religion for an obsession with with rock and roll, and more specifically, groups like the Beatles and Rolling Stones influenced you. Explain how. Well, there weren't many bands around back then, Jonathan. I know it sounds it sounds weird to say that, but you know we had a lot of individual stars, you know, coming from the '50s, you know, the Bo Diddley's and Chuck Berry's. Um, and we had a lot of doo-wop groups, harmony groups, um, but there weren't that many bands. And, and, um, and so I wasn't that interested in show business. I wasn't that interested in, in the individual so much. Although, you know, I was buying a few singles and, and, and enjoying, enjoying the, the records, but I never really had a connection to any of the artists uh, mm -hmm. until the Beatles came. And suddenly, um, uh, you know, here was a band and they were followed by like 15 more terrific bands. We called it the British Invasion. 
Um, and they, and they, and that communicated something different to, to me, and and I think to all of us. Um, you know, four or five guys uh, 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 singing and playing uh, was unusual. I mean, if you went to your high school dance, you, you only you, you saw an instrumental group. You know, there was nobody singing. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you know, and, and basically, um, the communication of, of of friendship and family and and community was really the communication that that, that turned me on, you know. Mm -hmm. And I, I I wanted to do that as a as a as a as a lifestyle, you know, more than more than the show business aspects of it, uh, you right. know. And I, but I, I also I I always combined the Beatles and Stones because the Beatles were just too perfect. You know, they they were they were a, rev a revelation of this whole new idea of being in a band, but they were so good. We you know we only caught them halfway through the career. You know, they mm -hmm. were already they were already fantastic. And then the Rolling Stones came four months later, and they made it look easier than it was. And and you know they didn't they didn't have the perfect party. You know, they kind of wore what they felt like. You know, kind of like the first punk band. And um, so how how I like to refer to it as as the Beatles introduced a brand new world to us, and the Rolling Stones invited us in. Oh, that that's terrific! You know, Stevie, I, I I don't know if you heard the 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 rustling after I asked that last question because your book fell out, your book fell out of my lap because I want to I want to <laughs> ask you about something that you wrote. You just talked about the Beatles and you talked about Rolling Stones, but in your book you also write about Little Richard and you write Little Richard, Little Richard was the embodiment and archetype of the of the philosophy of rock and roll freedom. My man, his flamboyant, multisexual androgyny said, you can be whoever you want to be. He turned rock into an art form that only, not, not only tolerated reinvention, but demanded it. And here's the line that jumped out at me. He opened his mouth and out came liberation. Yeah. Talk more, yeah. Talk more uh, about that. Well, all of that is true. You know, he, he was the one who... Who, who, you know, who said, you know, you can be anybody you want to be, and 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 um, and that was never attached to uh, what would become an art form, you know, the art form of, of rock, which was not not going to really be realized until the mid '60s. But 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 it began with with him, you know, say, saying that you know, you you not only are you free to be whoever you want to be, but you you know this 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 particular art form demands it, and, and you know so so you got to reach inside and don't be afraid you know stop being afraid of who you are, just just come out and and be be whoever you are and 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 be proud of it you know, and and I think he he was the one that really did that because you know I mean he wasn't he wasn't all the way out you know. But but being being a, a gay man and certainly you know androgynous, um, you know he had a sense of 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 of, of flamboyance and 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 of mm -hmm. of fashion and 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 uh, and one of the greatest singers of all time. I mean uh, literally, um, uh, you know I, I happened to catch a, a sound check with him once, you know, and he just sang uh, so so amazingly. You know I, I mean he's amazing on his hit records as well, but. Mm -hmm. uh, He's actually even even more versatile than, than his records revealed, but anyway, he 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 to me was the um, was the archetype of what would be rock and roll, and you know mm -hmm. Chuck Berry would be the king. I mean Chuck Berry brought the he brought the guitar and he brought the storytelling. You know you know so so Chuck Berry would be the the guy who started to really elevate it into an art form, but Richard just brought the the primitive primal scream. You know of like <laughs> um, I'm alive. You know, <laughs> I'm alive, and you and you need to pay attention to me. You know, <laughs> <laughs> all right. You better pay attention to me. All right, we got to talk yeah. about. Okay, we've we've talked about the Beatles, we've talked about the Stones, we've talked about Little Richard. Now let's talk about Bruce. Um, the friendship and and relationship that changed everything for you was when you met Bruce St Breen, Bruce Springsteen when you were teenagers. Uh, you described Springsteen as a like-minded outcast, true believer who became one of your most important friends and bandmates. Talk about the moment um, that you realized that you and Bruce Spring Springsteen clicked on and off stage. Well, there, there weren't that many bands, you know, like I said before, there, there, there was no bands in America, really, before the Beatles played this variety show called Ed Sullivan, which the whole family would watch every week, you know. Uh, 
he, he owned Sunday nights, you know, before the Sopranos. And, uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, you know, um, I, I, you know, we, we all, we, we all, we went from having no bands in America to everybody having a band the, the night after, you know. Uh, but only uh, most of them stayed in the garage where they belonged. But a few of us got out, you know, it was about a dozen in our area. And uh, and I had my band, The Source, and, and he had his band, The Castiles. And so we met each other, you know, just on the local circuit. You'd run into each other every now and then. But I started going up to, to, the, Greenwich, to the Greenwich Village on, on Saturdays, Saturday afternoons, where they would have bands all day, you know, at the Cafe Wa. And um, Cafe Wa is still there, by the way. And, mm -hmm. and, and so I would see all, all, see all these bands, and they were like a year ahead of what we were doing in New Jersey. You know, in those days, things were happening very, very quickly, and, and, and uh, things would change very much, you know, every couple of months. So you, you had to kind of keep up. And so I, I went up every, every Saturday, and I, and I would steal what I could steal and then bring it back to my band, you know. And and, um, and I started running into Bruce, you know, doing the same thing, <laughs> and uh, which was a little a little weird because you know it's only an hour, an hour and fifteen minutes on the bus, but you know when you when you're sixteen, you know, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, it's it's you know, it was it was pretty far out of town to go, you know. So I said, man, this is this guy's as crazy as I am, you know. And we started talking. And uh, we started hanging out, and then we started coming up to the village together, you know. Um, and, and, you know, I think we bonded immediately by the simple fact that, you know, um, we were the only two guys that we knew who believed in rock and roll completely, that rock and roll was everything, you know, not just a, a weekend thing or a hobby, you know, something like that. Uh, it, it was everything to us. And... Um, you know, and and we, you know, if you if you're the only freak in town, you know, mm -hmm. you start wondering, you know, maybe uh, maybe I'm a little weird, you know, uh, but if it's two of you, it kind of gives you a little <laughs> gives you a little. Well, okay, maybe we're onto something, you know. Mm -hmm. kind you of you got you have to, you have a little company. Yeah, and and that matters. Just just one other freak, you know, thinking like you th you do. You know, makes you less freaky, you know. So, so uh, I think we bonded right then, and and, and that's kept us best friends ever since. Mm -hmm. Um. And, well, I mean, it worked uh, from '75 to '84. You were in the band, but you write about the moment when things started to change. And I'm going to uh, read this and have you go into a little greater detail. You wrote, but somewhere in '82. It started to feel like Bruce had stopped listening. And you make the point earlier that you were Bruce's conciliary. You were the right-hand man. You were the person who, you know, he turned to for advice. But in 82, he, you write, he stopped listening. At the time, I was hurt by the thought that maybe John Landau resented my complete direct access to Bruce. I liked John a lot and thought he felt the same about me. If anything, I should have been the resentful one, but I wasn't. So go into greater detail about the friction at that time. Well, John was his new manager at the time, uh, we, 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 uh, we should explain. And, um, you know, it had just been me and Bruce all those years. And, and now uh, uh, a new friend had come into the picture, uh, John, uh, John Landa, who was not only his manager, uh, but he would also co-produce the records. And it was a very, very important sounding board um, uh, for, 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 for Bruce. So, um, so suddenly it was kind of like a, you know, a little, I was a little bit of, a, of an odd man out, you know, a little bit and, and um, started to get a little bit awkward. And um, it was kind of a perfect storm of a lot of elements, which I explain in more detail in the book. But, but I, had, I had become obsessed with politics by then and was kind of itching to talk about it. That I felt it needed to be talked about. You know, we had this grandfatherly, friendly cowboy, Ronald Reagan, you know, everybody loved. And meanwhile, a whole lot of crimes were being committed in, in, in the darkness. You know, they were very hidden in those days, uh, you know, as opposed to the previous four years where no crimes were hidden. But, uh, you know, so so I, I, I felt the need to talk about some of these things. And um, at a certain point, I just felt... You know, the best way maybe to preserve our friendship is to leave, you know, so and in and, and leaving, 
um, I, I kind of ended my life as I knew it. I mean, what had taken 15 years to get to the top, 15 years, um, I just walked away from it and, um, and had to, you know, begin an entirely new life, which is the whole second half of the book. Suddenly right. the story changes, you know, it, it, you know, well, you know, and the first half of the book is a whole nother story. It, I mean, it's a good story in itself, the kid from New Jersey who makes it all the way in rock and roll. But then the second half, I think, gets a little more interesting, a little bit more universal when it becomes a search for identity, a search for purpose, a search for spiritual enlightenment and, and mm -hmm. the, you know, the bigger, bigger themes, you know. Before we before we get to, to the second half of the book, though, uh, you 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 were sort of anticipating my next question is when you left the band because you wrote that um, occasionally you need to be untethered. You wrote that once you did that, you were quote persona totally non grata. That when you when you um, left the band, despite not publicizing any. There was no bad blood, but you say you were seen as a traitor virtually by everybody. Did that surprise, how surprised by that were you and how difficult was that? Yeah, I wasn't thinking of the consequences, you know, when I did it. So, so they, they slowly appeared, you know, as, 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 the, as the months uh, started to follow, you, you know, um, I realized uh, people were treating me differently, and uh, you know, I, I was I was losing uh, all all of my friends, uh, and uh, and uh, you know the the fans and friends all started to think of me as a traitor for leaving the band at that time, and so there was no real uh, encouragement. Oh, you know, he's a, he's a, they, they didn't see me as a legitimate artist of, of my own because I hadn't really revealed that I was one yet. Mm. Uh, so it was a lot of confusion mm. about that and uh, a negative sort of reaction, you know, uh, not not from Bruce. Bruce. Bruce said nice things about me on stage, you know, and, and, and gave, you know, said something nice on, on the Born to U Born to USA uh, album cover. You know, he was he was very encouraging, actually, even though he was disappointed that I wasn't taking that trip into mm -hmm. superstardom with him, you know, uh, you know, it was a disappointment and, and it was a big, you know, an awkward moment in, in our, in our relationship, but, uh, but everybody else took it much more seriously and, and much more negatively. And that would remain so for, for a while. Right. You, you use a, a phrase, uh, people didn't see you as a legitimate artist. And yet after you left, after you left the band, um, you recorded a series of critically acclaimed albums uh, in the 80s um, and you rallied some of the biggest names in music to fight South African apartheid uh, on the protest uh, classic Sun City. And this was in 1985, um, but you never found, maybe to your point, you never found a mass audience. How difficult was that for you? Well, it kind of still is. You know, <laughs> um, and and hence the title of the book. You know, because you know I, I've had some amazing successes, and and I, and believe me, I am I am absolutely grateful about them, and uh, and I'm not whining and complaining about it. But you know, again, I wanted to focus a little bit on that universal theme of everybody suffers some frustration and disappointment in in their lives. You know, I think everybody does, and and. Uh, in my case, you know, my 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 most personal solo work has never found a, a big audience, you know, to this day. Um, so that's not the question. It, the question is not, are you going to experience disappointment and, and frustration in your life? The question is, what do you do with that? You know, what, mm -hmm. what do you do when that happens? You know, and, and, and so I wanted that 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 theme to really carry the book, you know, that the. Uh, because everything I've done has happened since I left the E Street Band. You know, uh, the the five solo mm -hmm. albums, uh, you know, the Sopranos, Lilyhammer, Boston Mandela out of jail, et cetera, et cetera. All, all of that happened afterwards. You know, and you know, as much as you can say, well, I wish I could have done both. I wish I could have stayed and done all those things. That's really not very realistic. You know, in the end, so. So after that massive disappointment uh, and, you know, big mistake at the time, felt like a big mistake leaving, you know, I would end up 
finding a way to move forward and get some things done. And um, I think that's that's uh, hopefully useful to people and, and maybe even inspiring. You know, we'll see. Mm -hmm. You know, let's talk about this. Let's talk about The Sopranos, um, because you wrote about seeing David Chase back in the late 90s, who thought you would be the be perfect for the role of Silvio Dante on his new drama series, The Sopranos. How did that come about, especially considering you'd never acted before? Right. You know, my, a minor problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he saw me doing, um, I, I was completely out of the business by then, walking my dog, and um, and, and uh, they chose me to, to induct the Rascals into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, which happened to be the first uh, time that ceremony was, was broadcast, you know, so Destiny was definitely at work here, and David Chase is flicking around with the remote, stops on that channel by, by you know, by accident, whatever, and I did like a little, I don't know, three, four minute comedy, kind of comical induction. And he was looking for new faces for his, for his, what was going to be his last TV show. He had been in TV for a long time. And this was it. He wanted to start making a movie. So this was going to be his last TV show. And he wanted it to be different. He wanted new faces. He was going to break all the rules. And so um, he calls me out of the blue and says, you know, you want to be in my new TV show. I was like, man, that's so nice, you know, but no, no thanks, you know, I'm not an actor. <laughs> and and and, uh, and he was like, oh, yes, you are, you know, just, you know, come on down. So um, I went down and, and uh, um, you know, he actually wanted to cast me as Tony Soprano, uh, which was, <laughs> which, uh, oh. you know, luckily, yeah, yeah. Uh, and luckily, cooler heads prevailed. You know, and HBO wouldn't let him do it. And so, uh, luckily, we got the right we got the right Tony Soprano with Jimmy Gandolfini. But um, at a certain point, you know, because everything was happening so fast, I said to him, David, I got to tell you, I'm feeling a little guilty about taking an actor's job. You know, these guys work so hard. My wife's a real actor. She, I saw her go to school for years, acting classes, and you know, uh, off off Broadway and off Broadway. I said, you know, it's not right for me to come in here and take an actor's job. You know, so we said, okay, I'll tell you what, then I will write you in a part because it doesn't exist. So you're not taking anybody's job. You know. And and what do you want to do? And I said, well, I have I had a treatment uh, about this cat Silvio Dante, independent hitman, and he and he he worked in a in a, in a he had a club like like the old Copacabana, you know, kind of lived in the past, uh, big bands and you know Catskills comics and dancing girls and and uh, you know it was and 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 the, and the five families had all had their tables in in, in the club. Kind of like a mafia version of uh, Casablanca, you know. So uh, <laughs> he went away, came back a day or two later, said, "Well, you know, that's cool, but we can't afford it. So, so uh, we'll make it a strip club, and and you'll run the strip club for the family, you know." And that became the Bada Bing, and and uh, and you know, and and so so we I joined I I, I joined on, on that basis of not having been really written into the pilot, but sort of a, a new character. And um, and I wrote I wrote a biography of the character and saying that him and Tony were best friends and grew up together, not even thinking that I was you know 20 years older, you know I'm still 25 forever in my mind, but uh, uh, you know and 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 I shared it with the writers and David you know was kind of picking up on the relationship between me and Jimmy Gandolfini, uh, we bonded very quickly. You know, but I think because we were both more comfortable being side men and, and, and you know, he, in his case, a character actor, you know, and I think we kind of bonded that way. And uh, mm -hmm. and so slowly mm -hmm. uh, along, along somewhere in that first season, my character became the, you know, the underboss, you know, the consigliere, which which was uh, an important role in the mafia family that wasn't that actually didn't exist in in the pilot. So it was kind of a, a vacuum that, that that character ended up filling, mm -hmm. and being the only mm -hmm. guy, you know, and, and being you know being the only guy who doesn't want to be the boss, you know, somebody that that that, that, that the boss can really trust, you know, and uh, and so it slowly it slowly became the relationship that I had with with Bruce in real life. And, right. and so that became very yeah. comfortable, you know, very comfortable for me as an actor acting the first time. I knew exactly what those dynamics were all about, you know. <laughs> and being, you know, being and the, you know what? 
Right. And Steve, Sorry. you 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 write no no you write all about that in the book, and I have tons of questions about that, and we have zero time. But I want to give you um, real quickly the last question. Um, you're doing um, uh, an interview with Bruce, Bruce Springsteen about your book tonight. Um, right. I just want to put that out there for, for everybody. But in one sentence, what do you want people to take away from your book? Um, well, I, I, I hope that people can find it useful um, it's more than a book about a music guy. It's more than a book for musicians, I think. Um, and I, I hope people take away the fact that uh, uh, life sometimes uh, doesn't work out the way you planned, but um, that doesn't mean you should you should give up on it. You know, you, you got to keep moving forward and seeing uh, seeing what you can do to just you know realize your potential in this world and. Uh, and, 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 and try and find find your way, find a purpose, you know. And, and I think that, I think that's what, in the end, that's what that's that's the story that gets told. Stevie Van Zandt, I have all these questions about uh, about Teach Rock and your your little Stevie's Underground Garage and Sirius XM and and the prequel for The Sopranos, but we don't we are totally out of time. So I want to thank you very much for coming to Washington Post Live and remind everyone the name of your memoir is, which is out today, Unrequited Infatuation. Stevie, so great to meet you. Thanks again for coming to Washington Post Live. You too, Jonathan, my pleasure. And thank you for tuning in. To check out our upcoming interviews, head to WashingtonPostLive.com to find out more information and to register. I'm Jonathan Capehart. Thank you for watching Washington Post Live.